Let's welcome Adrian Ratiu from uh, Collabora, who's, who will be uh, tell us things about fixing kernel bugs. Hello everyone, and thank you very much for coming to my talk. My name is Adrian, I work for Collabora. We are an open source focused, upstream focused consultancy. So working with upstream projects, that's what keeps us engaged. I'm guessing everyone in this room. So I'll be giving a talk about my journey fixing a kernel bug, which has some security implications. Uh, this will be a weird talk because I'm fixing a security issue, making the security issue optional. So it's actually an optional fix, which is a bit weird. Um, we've been having a lot of talks about uh, measured boot, TPMs, and how to secure the boot process, which is a quite important part of security. But we have to ask what happens after we boot, right? Because after we boot at runtime, we connect to the internet, and a lot of stuff can happen. So this talk is focused on uh, runtime. OK. So I'll start with a very basic principle. This principle I took from the LWN article, which covered this work. So we had an article written about it. Uh, I have links at the end. I'll have a slide only with links. And yes, in general, memory should not be both executable and writable. And that's like a very simple security principle. But yeah, um, in practice, that happens, and that needs to happen. We have this trade-off between uh, inspecting systems, debugging them, and making them secure. And we have to be very careful at this intersection between visibility and locking systems down. So um, if we lock down a system, then we might prevent debugging that system. And this is quite a very well understood trade-off. So we've been having a loophole in the Linux kernel since version 2.6.39. Uh, that's pretty long ago. Uh, I don't even remember how many years. It's been more than a decade, I think, since 2.6. Uh, 2.6.39 was released. Does anybody know how long it has been? But yeah, anyway, so there's been attempts to fix it for uh, quite as long. So there was a commit in 2.6.39 which made um, a change which said there's no security hazard here. Like, uh, it's safe to do this. And after that, we had like CVEs and a lot of like drama, which started and also attempts to fix it. And now, I'm very happy to announce that with Linux 6.12, we have an optional fix. It's disabled by default, but <laughs> my hope is that we can actually enable it. And to do that, we need uh, user space as help, because we can break user space applications with it, specifically debuggers, container runtimes, and stuff which need to inspect other processes. Yeah. So we have procpidmem. It's quite a well-known file in the system. So it provides an image of the running, of a running processes memory, right? So you can use that file to access the memory of a process. Uh, the problem is in the right path of that system call. So it uses a flag which is called fall force. That's one bit which is set, and it's hard-coded in the Linux kernel. If you go in the file systems directory in the kernel, you have the fs directory, you have the proc directory, and then there you will have the base.c file, which is the base implementation of the operations for the proc file system. And in there, you will search for fall force, and you will find a line which just assigns it and enables it unconditionally in the system call write path. So if you do something like echo to that file, it automatically gets added, or if you try to write to that file, like many other processes try to do. Uh, so the procfs file system is just one way to write, like to process memory. And only this way actually hard codes that flag. There are alternatives like the 
process VM write V uh, syscall, which I mentioned here, that does not use that flag. That actually um, respects page permissions. Uh, the Linux kernel enforces memory protections, and it will not allow you to write, for example, to executable pages, right? But with procpidmem, you can do that. You can just override the executable pages of another process, and you can, like, execute your own stuff there, <laughs> okay? But not, not all mechanisms have that, and this is only a problem with procpidmem, and uh, yeah, um, there's actually a Wikipedia article mentioning it, and it's a bit inaccurate. <laughs> like, that's quite a surprise, right? So I'm quoting from that Wikipedia article on ProcFS. Uh, there's a line there which says that it can only be accessed by a p-tracing process, by a process which is an, like, uh, which has p-trace capabilities over another process. Like, for example, debuggers usually do. Like GDB, it will acquire p-trace cap capabilities. Uh, that's not entirely accurate. So if you dig into the source code, you will notice that um, the Linux kernel does not enforce an active p-trace relationship between a process and another when using procpidmem. So that's another problem which we're trying to plug with this patch set which I'm talking about. I will have a link to the patch set which also contains documentation, how to enable it at the end. So one thing which we're doing is we are trying to enforce uh, an active process-to-process p-trace relationship because uh, p-trace has a higher barrier of entry to actually do stuff. You have Linux security modules like YAMA, there's a config YAMA in the kernel, which can restrict who can get um, p-trace capabilities and on what processes you can actually inspect stuff. So yes, that's a higher barrier of entry, but uh, it's not like a complete fix. Uh, you know that security issues are always like races. You're trying to make stuff harder for the attackers. They try to find more creative ways to access the systems. And in addition to this, uh, there's also a very special file. It's PROC self mem. So PID stands for a generic process ID number, but PROC self mem is uh, accessing your own memory. And <laughs> that might seem a bit weird, right? Because inside one process, you already have access to your own memory. I mean, it makes sense. And because of this, the normal security checks which are implemented in the, this PROCFS file, they pass. <laughs> they pass by design when accessing PROC self mem. Because it's your own process memory. You're not trying to access other processes' memories. So yeah, you can just override your executable, your own executable pages, and like you can start executing stuff. So these are some pretty bad ideas which I mentioned here, and I am trying to be conscious to not uh, create like you have, let's say, ten or fifteen attackers. I don't want to create one hundred fifteen attackers by giving this talk call or like pointing to the uh, actual issues. But uh, I think you get an idea about what's the problem here. So many security teams are very well aware of this. I mean, there have been articles on nwn.net explaining things. And um, what security teams do, they tend to overreact. They tend to lock down the systems even harder. So what I noticed used in production was a scorched earth tactic. They try to like disable the write access entirely. So if that write access can be problematic in the proc mem write path, they just uh, hard code a return e access, and that's actually used in production. For example, there are systems which boot with uh, measured boot, which are locked down, which uh, developers could like open up, put in developer mode, and then unlock the bootloader and run their own like images. But for like the guaranteed stuff, they just uh, block that system call. The problem with this is that it will break applications, and there are some legit use cases for using that full force, which has been causing the drama. And uh, 
that might work. That might be a solution. So when I created my initial pet set, I tried to take into account that ability. Okay, let's uh, let distributions create a policy by which or a config or a boot parameter, this can also be controlled by kernel boot parameters, to also block writes entirely to procmem. Maybe that's not necessary to for a specific use case, like a robot or whatever. Okay, so <laughs> these things might not seem pretty serious, like hard coding a return e-access in a system call. It's like, uh, yeah, but, and what are the legit use cases? So let's start looking at some of them. So my work actually started because I had some devices and I wanted to inspect, and I wanted to inspect their memory using GDB. And I wanted to use a newer version of GDB. <laughs> However, I noticed that newer versions of GDB just don't work. They just, like, you try, you set a, you open GDB, you load the images, the debug symbols, you set a breakpoint, and when you actually try to run the program you're inspecting, you will get random errors, like, uh, cannot access memory at 0x, and you get an address. And why can't I access that memory? And I started digging, like, in the rabbit hole. And I arrived at this, like, fall force flag and how uh, certain distributions or security teams try to block it, and they just block the right path entirely or just disable that force, force, fall force flag. So uh, GDB, for example, it has what it calls a non-stop mode, and that's like the basic implementation of running and inspecting other processes. Non-stop mode allows you to run a um, process and inspect, for example, only one thread of that process while keeping the rest of the threads running, and that's what non-stop does. Uh, all stop mode, which stops the entire uh, process to inspect a certain memory or debug it, that's implemented on top of non-stop mode. So all stop is implemented on top of non-stop mode. And to implement non-stop mode, they designed their latest versions of GDB using procpidmem, specifically relying on that full force flag to overwrite memory. So that's, that's a bit problematic. Um, there are some workarounds. For example, GDB, if it can't open the um, proc mem file for writing for various reasons, it will fall back to the ptrace system calls, which have a poke and a peak semantic to uh, do the ptracing. So that works, obviously. That's not a problem if you try to block full force that flag usage in proc mem. But it doesn't work in all cases. For example, a GDB server. So a GDB server is used to do remote debugging. You start a debugging session on a remote device, and then you connect with GDB, you specify the remote dev device, and you debug it remotely. And unfortunately, GDB server doesn't have that fallback, so you will still get the errors. So I tried sending a patch to GDB upstream as well to add back the p system calls in the past, only the p system calls were used. They were not using proc mem, only when the redesign happened with like the non-stop mode. Only then they started uh, relying on that full force behavior. And it got necked. They told me it's not a problem in GDB, I should go and fix it somewhere else. I should go fix it in the kernel. Usually the most in interesting stuff is like when you have bugs which are at the intersections of domains or projects, like in this case. The GDB developers, they tell me, okay, it's not a bug in GDB, you have to go fix it in the kernel. Then the kernel developers tell you whatever. And um, I asked the GDB developers in the bug report, uh, if I just remove the fall force flag from <laughs> the kernel, <laughs> would that make you accept having like a um, ptrace fallback? And I got the response, sorry, I'm not trying to like uh, badmouth the GDB developers. They have actually been very helpful. Everybody's been very helpful in like uh, getting this fixed. Uh, they told me that is blackmail if I try to like pull the rug under them <laughs> from um, the kernel. So I can't just go in the kernel and remove it from the kernel. Then you have to accept the patch and you have to support all the flags. Okay, 
So I went to the kernel, but that will be like on my next going forward. There are other use cases other than just GDB. There's the RR and Julia just-in-time compilers. They also use PropidMem to run their code. And they want to do this as a hardening mechanism, as like a security improving mechanism to not just map pages which are both uh, writable and executable in their compilers. So we have to be very careful to not uh, break them. There's been discussions on the kernel mailing list with uh, the Julia and uh, RR developers, and they are open to add fallbacks and uh, to do what GDB also does for certain, like local GDB debugging, not the remote part. So everyone is basically happy to, to fix this. However, we can just do it right now because the current versions of Julia, GDB, or RR will just break. <laughs> because we, if we start enforcing in the kernel this restriction, which I've added, this is why I had to make it optional. And there's also a legit use case, which is the Incos container runtime. So this container runtime uses a mechanism which is called um, a SECOMP notifier, which is used to intercept system calls from processes which are supervised. So the supervisor will get a call when the supervised process does a system call, and it will get a file descriptor to its proc PID mem file to write its results there. This is how that works. And uh, it doesn't use fall force, and that's like a very good like example of doing, finding a way to not rely on that fall force mechanism, which basically ignores uh, read-write permissions in virtual memory. Uh, we had a talk before about inspector gadget that's also not affected, so that's a mechanism which can debug and inspect systems. It's using eBPF, it's implemented in the kernel, it loads and runs precompiled kernel code, so that's also not, not using full force. So there are some very good examples how to debug and inspect systems or how to do it without requiring that full force. So there is like uh, a lot of hope here. And yes, the aim here with my kernel patch is to not break user space. And this is a Linux kernel mantra. Like if you break user space or if you do something like which will break debuggers, containers, or uh, if you do that, it will get immediately reverted. And it will, you will get a lot of screaming, shouting, and that should never happen, right? Okay, so my first attempt of uh, patching this. I went, so after the GDB developers told me no, I went to the kernel developers, right? So I told them, okay, we need to fix this. The problem is acknowledged. Everybody knows about it. It's no like secret and it needs to be patched. We came up with a patch series. It went up to version six. I addressed uh, like all the feedback. It got part of the 6.11 merge window, so the file system maintainer was very nice to pick it up and uh, send it during the 6.11 merge window as a pull request to Linus, right? And then what happened is Linus <laughs> being Linus. So he said that, he literally said that he can't live with my patch, that it's so ugly and it's like a horror and <laughs> That should not be done. Like we try to add too many policies for user space, to add too many decisions to user space. Like, do you want to block just full force? In what cases do you want to block f just full force? Do you want only p tracers to be accessed to do full force to do full force accesses? Do you want to like leave it unrestricted? Do you want to block rights entirely, which some security teams do want to do? even though it might not be necessary, it's more like an abundance of caution. Do you maybe want to block the open syscall? Do you don't want to allow opens for these files which might be abused? So I try to push all that decisions like to user space to enable all that policy making. But Linus said, no, this is too ugly. This is like, um, this is pushing too much of the kernel implementation to user space. And a user space developer should not, or distribution maintainer should not be required necessarily to know what fall force means, right? And uh, yeah, so I went back to the drawing board. 
I restart it from scratch with a very much simpler patch, which just blocks fall force. And we're doing it with both configure parameters and boot parameters. So there are certain cases where you want to upgrade the system, but you can change the bootloader, right? So in that case, you can use a key config to just recompile the kernel and enable the, you can easily change the bootloader parameters which get passed to the kernel. But we have both options in the patch. And it's optional, it's disabled by default specifically to not break the existing use cases. And uh, we also changed the semantics. We had like block semantics, we now use allow semantics. So it's allow uh, using full force and yes. It was part of the 6.12 merge window which happened recently. We have the 6.12 release and it will be in the 6.12 release. So this is uh, very good news. Um, now, the important part, user space adoption. <laughs> so we need the help of various distributions to actually enable uh, this policy and um, we need also the help of various projects which are affected, uh, like GDB or the RR language to add the necessary fallbacks to work with this security mechanism. Uh, so we have three options in this new boot config which we added, uh, always allows accessing a proc mem without any restrictions, like it's done just now. Uh, if you give the ptrace value to the kconfig or the boot parameter, you restrict accesses to only active ptracers of a process, so all other, um, all other accesses are not allowed. So the full force flag is removed in that case, like if the process is not an active ptracer. Uh, this ptrace value actually makes the Wikipedia article true, <laughs> like that this, this actually fixes that and makes it true. And it's actually the value which I encourage for this option for uh, everybody to consider because it's not a high bar to ask processes which use or rely on this mechanism to become p-tracers. And it's, it will actually prevent most of the exploits. And never will just remove it, remove that line entirely. We'll remove the for, full force hard coding from the system called write path. So yeah, we have like three different levels of restric restrictions and only one kernel parameter. <coughs> yes, so it's a policy which needs to be set in the each distribution. We expect to boil the water as time goes. We expect to like, right now the default is always allowed, so nothing changes for now, right? But in future kernel revisions, we will bump, we will make ptrace default, right? We will change the default to be more restrictive. And then, um, hopefully after like all the legit use cases have cached up and have caught up and they've been fixed, we can even remove the allow option. We, should, we could not even give that option to do that. And then we can default to never. So over time, this will become more restrictive. Um, yeah, there's no like fixed schedule here because there are a lot of movie parts, a lot of process, a lot of projects, and we do not want to break like various use cases. That's like the mantra which we're working here, and that's actually like the biggest restriction. Otherwise, this thing ha would have been fixed a long time ago. Like people have been working on this like for a decade, like on and off. It's been usually when uh, a big new like hack was discovered, then people, okay, let's try to fix it again. Then, okay, it got left. And then after a few years, okay, let's try it again. And yeah. So I'm giving some links here, some further reading. So you have an access to these slides at that short URL. You have a link to the Wikipedia ProcFS article. I also put there two articles from LW. LWN.net, which is a super awesome uh, resource. I mean, 
everybody who's in like Linux and open source should read LWN. It's like super amazing. So there's an article from 2012 this, uh, describing this in depth. There's also one for from 2024, and you can see that uh, they have a lot of other links in the meantime with all the other attempts and discussions and drama around this. There's a link to my uh, first patch, which ar arrived at version 6, which got knacked. I also added the uh, link to Linus's message, which called my patch a horror, and it should not like be done. Then the second attempt, which actually made it to version 5, and it landed in the Linux kernel, so we have it in 6.12, right? We ha I have a link to the commit in the 6.12 kernel that also has a documentation entry, which is useful for distribution maintainers on how to enable this mechanism. And there's a cool blog post there at the end, which explains more how full force works, how virtual memory works, and how you can actually do stuff like write and execute your own code in other processes. And yeah, I'll stop there <laughs> with the ideas. I don't want to give people more ideas. OK. So thank you very much. Um, I do have a link there to the Open Emoji project. So thank you very much for uh, that. The emojis are awesome. And also, we are hiring. OK. Now, questions? Thank you. Here. So I doubt that you will ever be able to change the default in kconfig, unfortunately. Have you considered looking into adding, adding this kind of functionality to something like Landlock? You know, you know Pledge or Landlock? Yes, so that would be like a new uh, further development. We added like the basic mechanism, and that's an, actually a very, very good uh, remark. We need to integrate this into all the other like uh, security lockdown mechanisms and to make sure that it's enabled as part of those. So that's a very good follow up for that patch. And patches are welcome, by the way, because I'm doing this like more as like. Uh, I have some upstreaming time as part of my job, right? <laughs> but that's limited. I can't just spend all of my time like doing so ups. I think uh, Günther Noack from Landlock, I think he's quite interested in discussing with people the kind of ideas that people want to lock down. So I think he would be mm -hmm. interested in just hearing about this idea as well. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. That's a very good follow-up. Uh, so just to be clear, never is the only option where proc self mem would disable full force, right? Yes, that's okay. correct. Cool. Thank yes. you. Um, so with the JIT use case, why can they not just map a page as read write and then remap it to read execute? Why do they have to go through this proc self mem hack? They call it a security hardening mechanism. They, do, they think it's much easier to hack like a compiler which has the pages mapped directly as read and writable than um, having to go through proc mem. They view it as like adding an additional step, right? And if we add the restriction to also become an active P tracer, it takes even an additional step. But there's a case to be made that, OK, you can become a P-tracer and then do your hex, right? <laughs> you can. Uh, it's always like this um, back and forth between trying to prevent malicious code to run and the persons who want to run the malicious code finding more creative ways to actually run it. Any more questions? Yes. You said that the plan is to make it more restrict over the time. And then I thought about um, distributions with long-term support, like Ubuntu LTS with ESM with 12 years support. And a not unimaginable use case would be use that a user space stack and combine it with a new kernel because you want to run it on new hardware. Um, so with 12 years of support and 12-year-old software or even Older than that, uh, it will be quite a long journey. Um, maybe we reach the end of the journey before we are we end ourselves the, uh, the, the journey of ourselves before that will end in the kernel. So the generation after us might have to do it. Yes, and it's a very long-term problem. 
you can see that people have been working on this for decades already. It's over a decade, 15 years or something like that. And hopefully we can see an end to it in our lifetimes. But I'm, I am confident that we will do that, right? Um, I, think you I think you noticed that the Linux kernel, it started reducing its support windows. <laughs> The long-term support, it's now like two years, the default. It's not like six years or four years. It starts gradually decreasing, right? So that would also make uh, like people more willing to move faster, to upgrade faster. And um, Well, it's, it's reducing because the people that sponsored the really long-term, long LTS stuff have decided to move closer to upstream. Yes. So, uh, but I assume that distributions might catch up on this, and they are like, if if Zuzo or whatever decides to like fund this effort to make LTS last longer, then upstream LTS will last longer, unfortunately. Yes. And my hope is that security teams will actually ask, okay, move faster. Like, we need to fix this. We need to like, there can be pressure from the security side as well. Like, when you bring security in the discussion, things can happen faster, right? So. <laughs> that can get wheels moving. More questions? I see none. Then let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much.